Hi all, let's have a look at game five of that amazing Rozevsky against Fisher match of 1961. So game five moved location uh, to Los Angeles. The first four games were played in New York. So in game five, D4, we have knight f6 from Fisher, C4 from Samuel Rozevsky, E6 from Fisher, knight C3, D5, C takes, now knight takes D5, knight f3, C5, E3. The scene is set actually for a well-known type of position with the isolated queen's pawn now. So this has pros and cons for both sides. Knight f6. The bishop goes back. This has been seen before quite a lot, this configuration. With a3 here, there's no knight b4 risk. b6, trying to put pressure on the, this diagonal. Queen d3, bishop b7, bishop g5, threatening bishop takes now, and queen takes, h7, uh, seven mating. So g6. Rook f e1, rook e8. Maybe interesting is also rook c8, just with ideas of knight a5 immediately. But uh, rook e8, h4, very interesting, and actually provides support for the g5 square. This seems quite an accurate move um, in this position. Rook c8, rook a c1, knight d5. And now knight e4. So the g5 uh, piece is adequately defended here by both knights and the pawn. f5. This gets to be very sharp tactics coming up now after knight c3. Uh, we have a very sharp sequence now. This f5 has left this pawn backward, so this has become tactically, tactically quite critical, this position to get right. Uh, here, bishop takes g5 is played, which weakens that f4 square, and means now knight f4 is now possible, which not just protects e6, but hits the queen, and that g2, you see that's a coordination point of the knight and bishop potentially. And in fact here, after queen e3, uh, the move played in this position is queen takes d4. So. Rozevsky has intentionally gone to gone into what seems to be a dangerous looking position here where he's given up tactically the isolated queen's pawn. What did he have in mind here? Isn't he just drops a very important centre pawn? Well, knight b5. A very cunning tactical move. Actually, it's kind of showing that this knight is a tempo gainer and here not just hitting the queen but wanting to into lunge into the d6 square so it's actually very very tricky now queen takes e3 and f takes and there's a simultaneous attack on the knight and also to plunge into d6 to fork a family fork what's Fisher done what can he do here to rescue the situation has he been tactically tricked well, black to play in this position, what would you play here with the black pieces if I give you five seconds to pause the video? Okay, knight takes g2, radical measures are needed. If the knight just went back, then yes, knight d6 is going to be a big advantage for white. For example here, just winning the exchange, and this is just a total disaster area for black. There's pressure on the sea file, pressure on a further loss of material. So that's just horrible. So Fisher has to do this radical move. The idea now, knight d4, discovering a check, discovered check and hitting the knight. But there's an amazing tactical response here, played by Samuel Rozevsky. Can you see white to play, if I give you five seconds starting from now. So this is really fireworks from the isolated queen's pawn position. White to play. Bishop e4, yes. Bishop e4. Very dangerous now. So if knight takes, just taking here, fantastic position for white, a piece up. So Fisher plays the check and then takes here, but alas, he has to give in to losing the exchange here. Is it the end of the game? White's just the exchange up, right? Let's do the accounting here. There is a couple of pawns. Sometimes that's good. A4, but what about in, in the peculiarities of this position? Rook c7 check. 
White now dominates that C file with rook EC1. And there's two pawns hanging here. Fisher saves one of them, offering the other. Knight e4. Technically, this is actually a very good position for white at this moment. Rook a6. Rook b7 was also strong. It seems there's a common theme running from this position, which may be instructive in its own right, that actually white has two connected pass pawns uh, as a potential, but he has to well, has to factor in the rook and knight and the pawns converging on his king. I'll just run you through a very sharp scenario to give you a taste of why it has to be pushing his positions to the limits. This is just the scenario continuation, which didn't happen. But it shows that white can actually take out that knight just in time in these scenarios and avoid getting mated with the combination of rook, knight, and pawn. And in these scenarios, it seems that white will have the upper hand. So it's important, I think, technically to note that white did have a good game here, around about here. And maybe, uh, sorry, in the game continuation, uh, so rook b7 was, was pretty strong as well. And here, after rook d8, the cautious rook c2. And I, I think Fisher has said um, in, in his own annotations as though this was actually needed, but it seems as though it might not be. White has to be prepared to face a cold winter of rook and knight and these pawns, but it seems with uh, if he doesn't play rook c2 and just gets on with his own plans, as again, this kind of scenario, it's always possible, it seems, for white to just in time get rid of the dangerous knight uh, or, or evict the, uh, get the king out of uh, the foreign line. So this is another scenario which is favourable for white, slightly different from before. But it seems, yeah, white has to take that, what seems to be a huge uh, risk, basically. But white played cautiously here with rook c2. Yeah, so it seems as though um, it was possible to do something else here. Uh, so I don't know if any of you follow that that uh, series on Netflix called Suits. It says if you've got a gun to your head, there might be 120 different options. But here it seems white just parried it <laughs> instead, the gun being the rook knight and the pawns coming for his king. Yeah, you have to be like, it has to be like very carefully calculated to get away with this, to allow this coordination of what seems to be, you know, very aggressive stuff heading for the White King. But with this continuation, the problem is this e3 pawn is now a big target. And even though White now gets two connected past pawns, this pawn is now more significant immediately, and Black's going to get past pawns. And it looks as though here, visually, white's ahead in the race after a5, f4, rook f2, giving up the exchange. Maybe this wasn't entirely necessary. It seems rook b4, check, and this kind of scenario where white can even give back the exchange here tactically and end up slightly better with the advantage. So there are different scenarios where White's just in time giving back material. But in the game continuation, this again might be an inaccuracy because now Black seems back in the game. It still doesn't look as though Black should be back in the game because it looks as though White's ahead in the race here. But the Tarash rule is invoked, Rookie Free getting behind the most dangerous pass pawn now, which is a recommendation of Tarash, a simple and strong positional idea, you try and get your rooks behind the opponent's past pawns. And it seems though, conversely, black has pawn mobility, but white's pawn mobility has been put in check basically by the Tarish rule of the rook being behind the most dangerous past pawn. But these have mobility, and it's black that's getting back into the race basically with his own past pawns. They're first to sort of reap fruit. So two two past pawns, two past pawns. King is a tempo gaining target, but here White is giving up his rook now. It's got pretty desperate to try and queen here, but black's queening first. And in fact, black is able to now get out of the checks and just be winning. There's a lot of checks here. And here, uh, Samuel Rozevsky resigned. I think there's certain morals of this story. Uh, the first moral is if you're looking for any big lessons about the isolated queen's pawn,
this game is probably not it. It led into extreme tactical fireworks relating to G2 and White trying to win the exchange based on the configuration of the Rooks. Very, very specific tactics to the position. So that, for me, is not a major tell of this game, except you have to take the isolated queen pawn positions on their extreme own merits sometimes. I think the bigger tell is sometimes you have to be more concerned with your own pass pawns and, and face coordination of multiple opponent pieces and pawns to try and get an advantage. White had to play with great daring, it seems, and not uh, defend his second rank and let the e four. Uh, in the game the e3 pawn went anyway so there was it seems a very accurate way of playing it which could have given Rozevsky the advantage so a fascinating encounter and I hope you did get something from it as I did I believe comments questions like shares appreciated thanks so much